John, I've been fascinated, some would say obsessed, with the so-called mind-body problem my whole life. What is the relationship between my mental activities and what I know to be my physical brain? There are innumerable different solutions to the, this problem that some of them are easy to understand, some difficult. You've called them all false. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid I think the ones I know are all false, and I hope that the one that I propose isn't as false as the ones that I'm uh, attacking. Uh, basically, they break down into two kinds. Uh, the, uh, the most common ways of approaching the mind-body problem are either dualism or materialism. All right, let's discuss both of those. Okay. Well, they, uh, Start with dualism. Okay. The thing about both of these is they're both trying to say something true, and the trick is to try to rescue the true part from the okay. false part. Now, the dualist says we live in two separate realms. We live in the realm of the mental and the realm of the physical, the realm of spirit and the realm of matter. Now, this can have a philosophical determination yes. in ancient Greece, or, or, or it could have a very strong religious yes. one through the religious well, traditions, and all religions have some kind of a spirit or soul. So mm -hmm. we understand where that comes from. That's right. And indeed, there are two flavors to the uh, dualism. There's a substance dualism that says each of us is a separate mental entity. Mm -hmm. And uh, a separate mental substance. There are mental substances and physical substances. And then there's another a weaker version of dualism that is called property dualism that says, well, there is, there are genuine properties uh, of the brain, the, of uh, mental properties, but they're not physical properties, but they're not separate entities. The mind isn't a separate thing. It's just a collection of properties. So how do you brain. refute dualism? Well, the, the, the uh, quickest refutation of dualism is no one has ever been able to give a coherent statement of the relationship between the mental and the physical if they're identified as in two distinct ontological realms. Ontological is a big word. just means having to do with existence. If they're in two different realms, how, for example, could my conscious decision to raise my arm, cause my arm to go up. Because the physical world is, the, 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 is, is molecules, is neurons, mm -hmm. is all sorts of things going on that are all related to each other. It's a closed system. Exactly. How could something outside the system affect something within the system? And how could something within the system affect something outside? No dualist has ever been able to give an account of how uh, the brain can affect the mind or how the mind can affect the brain. And yet we know that it happens all the time. As I said earlier, I decide to raise my arm and the damn thing goes up and it's not an accident. So the uh, dualism for most philosophers today is not a real option. So most people go opt for some version of materialism. Yeah, and there are a lot of different ways that yes. you can be a materialist. There are all these different philosophical schemes, but basically you're right. They yeah. come down to some way of saying that all there is is one kind of stuff, a monism, so to speak, yeah. one thing. There's just that one matter. thing is the physical, and then they express it in all different in kinds of ways. Now, there are a number of philosophical attacks mm -hmm. against materialism. I'd like to discuss some of these yeah, with well, you and me, get your understanding. Let me mention some of the most okay. famous. Um, uh, one of the most famous attacks was uh, published by a friend of mine, Tom Nagel, and he uh, imagined that we have a perfect science of uh, bats. We know about bat physiology. We know everything there is to know about the neurophysiology of the bat. All the same, there's something left out of our knowledge. What does it feel like to be a bat? <laughs> But then, if that's right, it, if, the, if the essential thing about consciousness is what it's like or what it feels like, then any scientific account on our present conception of science would seem to leave out this mm -hmm. essential mm -hmm. feature. And indeed, any third-person account, any account that just discusses the objective reality, will leave out this essential feature of what it feels like or what it's like to be conscious. Now, there are variations on that argument. I'll mention a couple of them. Another one was by, a famous one was by Frank Jackson, an Australian philosopher. And Jackson says, imagine that there's a neuroscientist who knows everything there is to know about color vision. We call him Mary. <laughs> but Mary is locked in a room that is all in black, white, and Her gray. whole life. Her whole life. She's never seen any colors. Now, she knows all there is to know about color vision, but the first time she goes out of the room and sees a red rose, something occurs in her which has not occurred before. She now has an experience of red, and that was not captured mm. by her previous knowledge. Now, these all relate <laughs> to this concept of qualia, yeah. which is this term that philosophers use to describe that, that inner 
feeling, uh, experience, the first person yeah. that I know I know more than I know anything else, and I have no way of knowing whether your quality is the same as mine, but I know that I have it. Yes, now, it, that, and this leads to another argument. The idea of qualia, that uh, each of us has uh, uh, these qualitative states and consciousness it consists in these qualitative states or qualia, that seems to be left out of the materialist mm -hmm. account. And this is sometimes called the, account, the argument from absent qualia, that the, that the materialist necessarily leaves out qualia, and I think both Jackson and Nagel are getting at that. At that. Yeah. But now there's a, there's, a, there's a flip side of the same argument, and that's called the zombie yes. argument. And the zombie argument is kind of a neat <laughs> argument. It says, look, you can imagine a beast that behaved exactly like me, but was totally unconscious. And this is a zombie, somebody who has all of my behavior, all of your behavior, but is totally unconscious. And if you ask the zombie, are you conscious? It will say, of course. Of course I'm yeah, conscious. Of course I'm conscious. Can't you, can't you see that I'm conscious? I'm engaging in a conversation <laughs> like yeah. anybody else. But says the... the, the but uh, there's no inner stuff going right. on. What the anti-materialist says is the very possibility of zombies, not that, they, that we're going to go and build a zombie, we wouldn't have any idea how to do that, but as a thought process yeah. for showing the difference between mental states and physical states, the mere logical possibility of zombies is sufficient to refute materialism. That's an extraordinary point, that you don't have to really have it. You don't, it, 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 you, it could be impossible to create, yeah. but just the logical possibility alone. Yeah, well, what we're trying to show is the difference between conscious beings and unconscious that beings. That there's something left out That's if you right. have all these other explanations. And that is the general attack on any version of materialism. Namely, it leaves out the mind. That the, uh, the behavior can be the same, the material structure might even be the same, but you leave out the mind. The inner experience. You leave out the inner qualitative experience. That's the argument. That's the zombie argument. Now, you've had perhaps the most famous argument that has been used against the traditional materialist approach, the Chinese room. Well, let me say a brief word about that. The Chinese room was designed not as a general argument against materialism, but as an argument against a specific version, mm -hmm. namely the, what I call strong artificial intelligence, or some people call it computer functionalism, the idea that all you have to create to create a mind is to design the right computer program. Right. That the computer program is by itself is sufficient for having a mind. If you get the right program, right input and output, that's it. You've got it. Now I have a simple refutation of that, and I can state it in a couple of minutes. Here's how it goes. Take some cognitive capacity I don't have. I don't speak Chinese, for example. Now imagine that I'm locked in a room where I implement the steps in a computer program for answering questions in Chinese. You have a rule book. Yeah, so they, they pass me in Chinese symbols. I don't know what they mean. I look up in the rule book what I'm supposed to do. The rule book's called a program. And I give back symbols that are the right answers to the questions. Now we suppose that the com programmers get, get so good at writing the rule book, and I get so good at shuffling <laughs> the symbols, that my answers are indistinguishable from a native speaker. But uh, all the same, though I pass the test for understanding Chinese, I don't understand a word of Chinese. Mm. And there's no way I could learn Chinese if all I had were shuffling symbols in a room. And now, and this is the bottom line of the argument, if I don't understand Chinese on the basis of implementing the computer program for understanding Chinese, then neither does any other computer solely on that basis. Mm. The, the com computer program by itself is neither constitutive of nor sufficient for human cognition, for human understanding. Mm -hmm. Such an obvious argument. <laughs> but anyway, I, I published that over 25 years yeah. ago, and the debate still rages. <laughs> all right, so we have all of these arguments that attack either materialism in its core or an aspect of it. Uh, how, how do you then reflect on it? How do you then take what's right about dualism yeah. and, and eliminate what's wrong and, yeah. and what's right about materialism? Okay, the way I operate is to try to remind myself of what we know for a fact before we ever get going in this argument. Before we ever uh, have ever heard of Descartes, what do we know for a fact? Well, we know that conscious states are real. Now, you know, somebody might say, but why can't we show they're an illusion? We show that color's an illusion or solidity is an illusion. And the reason there's a difference is this. If I consciously seem to be conscious, <laughs> if it consciously seems to me that I'm conscious, then I am conscious. You can't. The, the way we get rid of color and solidity is showing the distinction between reality and illusion. 
but where the existence of consciousness is concerned, the illusion mm -hmm. is the reality. Yeah. If it consciously seems to me that I'm conscious, I am consciousness. So that's point number one. Consciousness is irreducible. Secondly, we now know something that Descartes could not have known. All conscious states are caused by brain processes. There aren't any exceptions. Every single conscious state is caused by brain processes. And third, we know that consciousness it goes on in the brain. That's where it's localized. Conscious states are features of the brain, as I like to put it. It's realized in the brain. And then fourth, we know it functions causally. Now, if you take those four propositions, then it seems to me, then you go back and look at the tradition and try to answer the tradition in terms of those four. See, the problem is that most people start with a tradition, and then they think, well, we can't assimilate these yeah. four, so they want to deny, then they end up saying something false. And that's why I said both materialism and dualism are trying to something, say something true, but they end up saying something false. <laughs>